national stories are dominating uh, the newspapers today and looking at the Irish independent coup in Turkey denounced by EU US leaders. That is just that quite extraordinary uh, scenario that has been unfolding in Turkey whereby the military tried to take over the country last night and oust President Recep Tayyip Erdogan from power. And I mean, at one stage you had a scenario whereby the president was uh, on a plane uh, waiting to see whether he could uh, return uh, to the country. It, it was an absolutely quite an extraordinary situation and, and uh, that is going to unfold uh, throughout today. Now obviously the situation in France is as well dominating the headlines. Irishman shot by Bastille uh, terror cop. Uh, an Irishman is in a critical condition after he was shot by mistake during the French truck uh, rampage that killed uh, 84 people. So, and, and I mean, I think we might actually start on, on that issue and, and to read the, from the front page of the Irish Independent, minutes after enjoying Minutes after enjoying the fireworks display marking France's National Day, ten children lay dead on the promenade in Nice. And Simon Harris has kindly joined us uh, on the phone lines. And Simon, before we do talk about other issues, can you please give us your reaction to, to those devastating events unfolding in Nice? Well, good morning, Nile, and thank you for having me on. Well, I, like so many people right throughout this country and right throughout the world, are just absolutely devastated um, with the events that have taken place in Nice. I, um, I, along with a lot of other people, were at a reception that the French ambassador to Ireland was, was hosting to mark Bastille Day um, on that evening when the terrible events started to break. And, you know, at a time when we were, I suppose, celebrating the strong relationship between Ireland and France, and indeed, to the time when the French ambassador was remarking about the solidarity that had been shown uh, with French people from the Irish people during previous terrorist attacks, little did anyone think um, that France would be in the depths of an awful, disgusting, grotesque terrorist attack just hours later. So my heart uh, go out to everybody I and mean, people out having, having a family evening, marking a national day. And just to watch the images, um, it's just absolutely chilling. But Europe will, will have to rally together and the world will have to rally together and really address what is a massive threat uh, facing all our people um, right across the continent of the European Union. And it does, of course, Simon, doesn't it, uh, you know, create questions for people when they're travelling across Europe this summer. Should I go there? Should I, uh, you know, revise my travel plans? And it also raises the questions in our minds, are we prepared for a potential terrorist attack if it does happen on our shores? Sure, and I think, and I think, I think people, people will always have those concerns in relation to is it safe to travel, and I'd encourage people to always link in with our Department of Foreign Affairs, who provide advice to Irish citizens in terms of of travel plans and safety. But I would say, on a personal level, and certainly my own view is, we can't allow terrorism stop us going about our daily lives. That is that is what terrorists want to achieve. They want to bring us into a state of paralysis, a, a state of fear, a state where we're afraid to live our normal lives with our families. And I know that the security forces in France and indeed security forces right throughout Europe are working so hard and are working collectively. And here are the efforts being led by the Thomas and the Minister for Justice in terms of a sharing of information and cooperating um, with other European countries. And really, that is the only way um, we're going to manage to defeat uh, terrorism and, and protect our people is by working together. One small country on its own like Ireland or indeed even a larger country simply can't do this on our own. We need to see greater cooperation and there's a huge body of work underway at a European level in that regard. You're listening to Simon Harris, our, our own local TD and health minister who's kindly joined us on Wicklow this week. Do please send us a text if you have any questions for the minister 87 103. You can also get us on the phones 0818 Now minister, moving on to uh, an issue that has dominated uh, the domestic agenda this week and that in, re relates to console. Can you talk us through uh, you know, the, the events this week, why you did what you did as health minister, uh, which has wound, wound down this scandal hit charity? Sure. Well, firstly, I, wa I want to start by paying massive tribute to David Hall. Um, your listeners will know David Hall as the man who went in as the interim CEO, a man who has a long record of involvement in, in charitable causes in this country and indeed in business. And David went in and, and took over Console on an interim basis after the really disgusting and disturbing revelations about the carry-on of, um, of some very senior people in Console came to light. Console is a charity that we all held dear to our hearts. Um, people here in Wicklow will have known of the excellent work it did in relation to bereavement counselling, in relation to the operation of a 24-hour suicide helpline. Um, and and this is some, these are services that we valued. They're services that the HSE had funded uh, for quite a period of time. But really, once these revelations came to light, 
it fast became evident that it simply wasn't possible for Console to continue as it was. Um, it was a, it was effectively insolvent, um, and there were serious questions about some practices that had been undertaken by some people at the very top of Console. My priority as Health Minister, and the priority of David Hall and the HSE, was to make sure that we didn't lose the, the, the services, that the brilliant bereavement counselling services, that the helpline that people rely on, 6,000 people a year were using these Console services. So there's been a massive amount of work behind the scenes over the last few weeks to try and transfer those services to a another service provider, and to make sure that the services were ready to go before Console was liquidated. And the HSE okay. was, was up at the Public Accounts Committee this week. Are yes. you confident as Health Minister that the HSE did all it could to uh, act on this, uh, act on the issues in, 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 at Console as soon as, as soon as possible? Did they act fast enough? Well, I think there's always lessons to be learned, and I don't want to answer that question categorically until we've absolutely seen the recommendations that will arise from the Public Accounts Committee. As a former member of the PAC, I'm very eager to adopt any recommendations that come from that body. There's also a body of work being done between our new charity regulator and remember we've new structure in place in terms of the charity regulator and the HSE, a memorandum of agreement. Who should tell who should tell who, what and when uh, if an incident arises. But what I am confident of is that the HSE didn't cause the problems in control. The HSE was purchasing vital services to support people in a vulnerable situation. And I'm also confident that were it not for the excellent work of the internal audit unit within the HSE, we may not know all that we know about what went on in relation to control. And I must say, thirdly, what I'm particularly pleased about is that after this disturbing information came to light, that the HSE have worked uh, very well alongside David Hall and alongside myself as Minister to make sure that the services are continue to be funded and just to finish that point, those services have now been transferred in full to Beata House so the helpline continues to run today people who are getting bereavement counselling I think there's 314 people that bereavement counselling continues today and if people who are listening in and they're, they've been getting bereavement counselling just to say to them and to assure them they will hear from their bereavement counsellor um, in, in terms of next steps but your counselling will continue and you shouldn't notice any difference in terms of your service. But it's about public confidence, isn't it, Simon? And, and um, much, has yeah. public confidence not been so undermined in the charity sector? Uh, and and it, that's a really, really concerning issue if, if it has. And are you not concerned that this could only be the tip of the iceberg, that more and more of these issues in different organisations are going to unravel <laughs> in, in the months to come? I'm very concerned about the impact on public confidence because I see as Health Minister some of the best elements of our health service are provided by the voluntary sector. Um, we have a tradition, for better or worse in this country, that a number of services that our people use on a daily basis are provided by the voluntary sector and funded through, through, through the health service executive. And, and some, as I say, some of the best services and some of the best value for money services are provided. However, where a bad apple arises, it does run the risk of, of, of creating a level of public concern about other services. That's why this government, and indeed the last government which I was involved in, established the charity regulator. From the start of September, that charity regulator will have extra teeth um, in terms of a regulatory function. Their first job was to register all the charities. I think there's more than 12,500 charities in this country to register them, identify them, support them in registering, and now to have a regulatory function. The other thing is I've asked that the HSE will carry out a full root and branch examination of what's known as Section 38. These are the 40 largest voluntary organisations we fund. There's six of those uh, audits already underway. This is where they go into each and every organisation. They check that the organisation is in compliance. They check that not just are people signing forms to say they're doing A, B and C, but that A, B and C are actually being done. And I do hope that those measures, by bringing in an external expert to carry out that, will help public reassurance. Because what we don't need to happen what we don't need to happen is the really good, decent people working in charities in Wicklow and right around this country today, we don't need a situation where everybody gets tired with the one brush because we're very dependent in this country on the excellent work carried out by the voluntary sector. I think the PAC hearing yesterday was carried out in a very, uh, in a very informative way, in a very dignified way. I think um, there's a lot of information now that the PAC need to pull together, and I'm sure they will. And I look forward to hearing any recommendations that they have and I can assure them that I will work with them to implement them. Just one separate uh, health issue, if I could, Simon. Uh, sure. you know, your party is synonymous in the past of, of ta with taking away medical cards. Uh, I think you're, you're trying to change that, certainly with your public comment yesterday. You're talking about medical cards for any sick children or, or very sick child will get a medical card if, if they need it. 
Well, y- your listeners will know, before I was involved in politics, I was involved in working with families uh, with autism. And I've seen the challenges that families can face in accessing the supports that they need. And I can see the frustration that families face in having to fill out one form to get a domiciliary care allowance, another form to get a medical card, another form to get something else. What I have announced this week in fulfilling a commitment in the programme for government is that in the budget in October, budget 2017, I intend to make provision to provide an automatic entitlement to a medical card for every child in this country in receipt of domiciliary care allowance. There's about 10,000 children today who receive domiciliary care allowance but do not receive a medical card. Um, I think there's an inherent unfairness in that. Um, there's also a huge stress level that goes for parents having to fill out forms and appeals and submit reports. If you if you reach the threshold whereby your child receives domiciliary care allowance, that should be good enough for the health service to say, we well, therefore should have access to a medical card as well and shouldn't have to drum, jump through another four or five hoops to access one. So in the budget, there's a cost of probably around 19 million euros. In the budget, I intend uh, to make provision um, through the health vote to ensure that we can provide automatic entitlement to medical cards. This means that the medical cards um, will be available for these children automatically uh, from early in 2017. And I must pay tribute to the excellent group called Our Children's Health, who've been campaigning for this for quite some period of time. I met them outside government buildings within days of being Minister for Health, and I met them in my department uh, last week uh, to update them on this. So I need to bring in legislation. Work is underway in my department to draft that legislation. So there's a few months' work to be done in this, but 10,000 children who, who, have, who have certain conditions, who are in receipt of domiciliary care allowance, will automatically receive an entitlement to a medical so card. So it'll be this October's budget? It'll be done in this October's budget, and it'll be implemented early in 2017. Now, tell us about the infighting in Fine Gael. Uh, no, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, you, you always love the intrigue. No, I mean, uh, look, this, this issue has been um, discussed to death, I suppose, in the media. Um, and in politics over the last number of days. And really, to be quite frank, I think if anything emerged during the last week, it's that people really want this government and all of us involved in politics to get on with the job of doing what we were elected to do. There's more than 600 commitments in the programme for government. More than 130 of those commitments are in my own department in terms of the health area. We need now everybody in government to put their shoulder to the wheel to deliver the programme for government. The government, yeah. I think, is about 10 weeks in office. And that's You're fine, right. and you know, that's fine Simon, that's fine. But yeah, you do have people sure. in your party who say... Enda Kenny has outlined his plans to leave, or he certainly has indicated he's going to step down. He won't lead uh, the party into the next election. But just give us a time frame. That's all your TDs are saying. That's all Brendan Griffin, uh, Pat Deering and others. That's all they want. A time frame from the Taoiseach so that, that there can that, be a smooth transition. That, that's, all, that's all a very few, a very, a very small number of my colleagues wanted. The overwhelming majority of my colleagues, the overwhelming sense that our parliamentary party the other night was that the Taoiseach... Um, will lead this government until the time that the Taoiseach uh, believes is right, that the Taoiseach has made it clear that he won't lead my party to the next general election, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll put in place a transition at the appropriate moment. But all Fine Gael TDs, including the ones you named, traced through the lobbies of Leinster House only about 10 weeks ago to vote for Enda Kenny to the Taoiseach. That's what they did. They voted to elect Enda Kenny about 10 weeks ago. Now, I think the people listening to this programme today, and certainly, uh, certainly I, want to actually see government getting on with the job and actually getting down to addressing the real issues. We've seen Brexit, there's serious challenges facing this country, there's serious domestic challenges in terms of health, in terms of education, in terms of jobs, mortgages, making sure people feel the benefit of a growing economy. So what we don't now need is naval gazing, what we need is a government getting on with the job at work. We have a new team in place um, delivering a very ambitious programme and as I say, Enda Kenny in my view has served this country very well and Enda Kenny will, will, will transition um, in terms of the leadership um, at a time that he believes but eventually there will be, there, eventually there will be a contest will, will your name be, be in the ring well that issue simply doesn't arise at the moment that, that would be engaging in the naval case in the well Leo Varadkar says he, he, he wants to be leader Simon Coven has indicated he wants to be leader Frances Fitzgerald has indicated she wants to be leader do you want to be leader at the moment, my absolute overriding priority is to be the best Minister of Health that I can possibly be and the best TD that I can be for Wicklow, and I, ha- I have no other plans other than that at this stage. So it's kind of like a Pascal Donoghue answer, isn't it? You're, well, I, in fact, he, he has ruled himself out, but you, you don't seem to be willing to rule yourself out. Well, you, you don't rule something in or out that simply doesn't arise at the moment. What you do is you get out of bed in the morning and you do the very best at the, very jo- at the job that you've been given. I've been given one of the most challenging jobs in Irish politics. Um, it's a job that's really important in terms of the impact it has on people's lives, and I'm going to 
give that my absolute all and that's my absolute overriding priority. Uh, Simon Harris, thank you very much for joining us and just a, a word of congratulations on your engagement and your recent engagement to Queen. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you very much. That's Simon that. Harris, uh, Health Minister and Local TD. Joining us on Wicklow This Week. Now, coming up next, we'll be talking to mother of Ratnew toddler Poppy Myrna. That's Jennifer Tynum. She's going to be joining us on the line.